I spoke there about uh, um, President Bagbo of, of Cote d'Ivoire, um, who was on trial, who was under, under arrest at The Hague, and is supposed to go on trial uh, next month in, in November. And I was saying that, you know, the uh, President Chisan, I don't know, people know here that there is something called the Africa Forum, which is uh, former heads of state and so on on the continent, and, and other people leading Africans, uh, former secretaries of the UN, OAU, African Union, etc. Uh, Africa Forum. Uh, the chair is President Chisan, uh, who is coming next month to, to do the Steve Biko lecture. Uh, he's written a letter on behalf of the forum to the uh, prosecutor at the International Criminal Court and says in the letter, um, we as Africans believe that uh, uh, President Bagbo is critically important for the future of Cote d'Ivoire for peace and reconciliation in Cote d'Ivoire. And that if that matter is not addressed of peace and reconciliation in Cote d'Ivoire, then Cote d'Ivoire is bound to have a civil war resume. So here we have a choice. You know what's happened there with the Bagbo case at the, they've got a, what is called a pre-trial court now that's the prosecutor presents uh, uh, charges against whoever at the pretrial court. The pretrial court looks at the charges and assesses whether this case should go to trial. So where uh, the prosecutor presented her evidence to the pretrial court, this was I think 2013 if I remember well, it's, uh, it's three judges sitting together, and two of the judges say, Madam Prosecutor, you have no case against President Bagbo. One of the judges says, no, no, she has a case. But two say no. Now, instead of, I don't know how many lawyers there are here, but instead of saying, which is what I think a judge should have done in those circumstances, therefore, uh, President Bagbo is found not guilty and released. No, they instead say, we give you nine months to prepare better charges yeah, so that... Uh, and, in the, and in the meantime, we'll keep him detained, which they did. And then uh, she comes back uh, to the court uh, earlier this year, uh, pre-trial court, one of the judges, two of the judges say, you now have got something which looks like a case. One of the judges says, you still don't have. Uh, but anyway, the majority say, no, let the matter go on trial. So that's why he will then appear on trial next month. But President Chisano is saying, but look, even the pre-trial court is very doubtful about the substance of this case. In the meantime, by keeping this man at the Hague, you are denying us, the Ivorians first of all, but the rest of the continent, the possibility to address this very important issue of peace and reconciliation in Cote d'Ivoire in order to avoid a civil war that's going to be very destructive. So anyway, there we are. <coughs> I, I don't know whether the prosecutor has responded to President Chisano. But, <clears throat> so the question arises, uh, should Africa belong to the ICC? That's how the matter gets raised in London. Because this is our actual practical experience. I'm saying in the case of Kony, they were negotiating a resolution to this conflict that had taken so many lives, not only in Uganda, but also in that region. And we're going to find a solution. And then somebody said, no, off to the Hague. And the matter collapsed. And there's President Babu at the Hague. 
and the threat that faces us in Cote d'Ivoire is a resumption of civil war which is going to claim the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. Should Africans continue to be in the ICC? The committee will have to see whether, <coughs> whether this is a matter on which it should act. It is important because this issue about justice and peace. It's now my uh, pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. David Hoyle. He's an African academic and researcher, director of the Africa Research Center, who has written extensively about countries in crisis, such as uh, Mozambique and Sudan, and published, among uh, many others, a book on the International Criminal Court called Justice Denied, which is here in the, in the room. Uh, David, you have the floor. Thank and, you. and thank you also to the organizers of this, this meeting for uh, honoring me by inviting me to actually take, take part. Um, I'm going to speak essentially on the International Criminal Court itself um, and of course it uh, is playing a very specific role within Cote d'Ivoire as it has also played uh, a similar role I think in, in many of the other situations in which it's, it's uh, involved itself. Um, just one, one thing, the actual uh, um, theme of this meeting of course is, is the, uh, the future of Cote d'Ivoire and, and the court. And my immediate uh, observation is that whatever the future, uh, the ICC will not be playing a constructive part within it. That's the, the sad reality of it, of it now. You know, the, the comments I will make uh, will be uh, largely uh, uh, quite so critical of the ICC. And that, that's, I think it's important right from the start to make it very clear that the desire for justice, especially in the face of egregious uh, human rights abuses, is one of mankind's most noble instincts. The difficulty you have with the ICC is it's not going to be found within that mechanism. The ICC, unfortunately, and its behavior since it came into being in 2002, makes, uh, 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 makes it the friend, in effect, of despots and dictators, because by its, its own actions, its own behavior, its own involvement, uh, at this stage in time uh, within Africa, it has actually uh, uh, badly affected, badly damaged the whole concept of international justice. Many of the countries who were involved in the Rome, um, our Rome Conference of 1998, which, which actually uh, brought into being the ICC, um, were countries that actually thought that the ICC would be uh, a genuine mechanism for uh, um, bringing justice within certain circumstances and situations where justice had been absent in the past and in, in circumstances where uh, um, it may also be uh, uh, difficult to get it in, in the future. They thought that uh, the ICC would be that mechanism. It would actually bring to book, bring to account many of the states perhaps that had been involved in uh, unilateral interventions internationally which had it, uh, uh, themselves actually provoked a wide range of, 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 of devastating circumstances and, uh, and, um, and behaviour. Um, unfortunately, the ICC is, has not proved to be that me uh, other mechanism. Many countries, and especially I think the, the 34 member states within Africa of the ICC, were promised the Rolls Royce, a Rolls Royce of judicial institutions. What they see before them now is a third or fourth hand broken down pickup truck. It's in no ways what they were promised. They were promised some of the best legal minds to be in charge of, of this court. And again, to use a, a car analogy, what they actually got by way of a chief prosecutor was a unlicensed uh, a boy racer who actually drove the court into every single tree he could find on the way. So the, the image, the promise of the ICC, unfortunately has actually degraded uh, uh, literally uh, up, up before the eyes of anyone who's actually looked, looked into it or been subject actually to it. One of the most important things, of course, about any court, and I'm, I'm sure there may well be a few lawyers here, is independence. A court has to be independent in order to be credible. The ICC, by its own statute, 
gives special prosecutorial rights of referral and deferral to the, the United Nations Security Council, perhaps the world's most political body. And when you, of course, say the UN Security Council, you are, in effect, referring to the, the Permanent Five. They are the ones, in effect, who control that power of referral or deferral. The special prosecutorial power that is actually given to them by the ICC's own statute. Three of the five members of the Permanent Five are not even members of the ICC. So the United States, Russia, and China aren't members of the ICC. So we, uh, you've had the uh, inc incredibly sort of uh, uh, um, you know, questionable circumstance where the ICC has given powers to the UN Security Council, three of five members of the permanent five not being members of that institution, have then actually referred other non-member states of the ICC to the ICC. So it's, it's a non-secretary actually followed by another non-secretary. Yet this is actually ingrained within the, own, the, the ICC's own, own statute and, uh, and raison d'etre. Now, of course, you also have the circumstance that two-thirds or more of the funding of the ICC actually comes in essential, well, uh, in essence, actually from the European Union. So two-thirds, maybe up to 70% at this moment of time, is paid by uh, uh, EU member states. And as we say in English, he who, who pays the piper calls the tune. The actual reality is that uh, not a single North American or European politician or serviceman will ever appear before the ICC. That is just the actual reality. And that, of course, um, is one reason why, rather than look at the 1.17 million alleged war crimes that the ICC has been made aware of, officially made aware of in Afghanistan, it has actually chosen instead, for example, to pursue um, allegations of arson in Mali. So you see almost immediately where they, they choose to actually focus their time and, and resources. So this is actually one of the, the um, uh, realities of the, the uh, lack of independence that the ICC has right from the beginning. So actually 41 black Africans, not a single European, North American, or any other sort of racial group. So in this instance, many people have actually said that the ICC is in effect a racist institution. And by its own behavior at this moment in time, that's a very, very valid accusation. Um, the, I mean, that's maybe the big picture, the macro picture. The micro picture is even worse because as far as the running of a court is concerned, it's been a shambles, an absolute shambles. You've had a chief prosecutor who was actually caught, uh, caught actually hiding hundreds of items of exculpatory evidence, not just from the defense, but also from the judges in trials. Now, in Britain, if you had a, a prosecutor who was hiding hundreds of items of, of evidence from the defence or, the, or the, the judges, he would be actually debarred as a lawyer, and also he would probably face charges of actually perverting the course of justice. The chief prosecutor, of course, was actually let off uh, with a wrap over his, his knuckles by his colleagues within the ICC. So that's, a, that's actually one aspect also of the actual you know, day to day running of, the, of a court itself. You also, of course, have had almost unprecedented difficulty within the ICC on the issue of, of witnesses. And one of the big difficulties with that is that the ICC actually receives the witnesses in order to actually prosecute from uh, third party organizations. There are now a whole range of NGOs who are, in effect, a, a industry aimed actually at uh, 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 procuring witnesses for the ICC. And the actual reality of this is that every single trial so far, from day one until now, has been marred by witness tampering and by witnesses who are then seen to have been un unreliable. In the first big trial of the ICC, that of, of Thomas Labanga from the Democratic Republic of Congo, 
day one of the first trial for which the ICC had prepared for years. Day one of the first trial, the first prosecution witness in the box says, uh, Mr. Judge, I'm sorry, I have to actually admit, uh, I've not been a child soldier, because that was the charge. I've been coached by NGOs, I thought to say, I don't want to lie to you, um, you know, this is actually a, a farce. Day one, witness one of the first trial. And all the way through to now, and, and two years ago, you had the actual situation where the ICC star witness in the case against the Kenyan Vice President, Mr. Ruto, uh, the, the Chief Prosecutor's Office themselves had to admit, quote, that their witness was thoroughly unreliable and incredible, end quote. This is the ICC for you. Now, of course, uh, a part of that um, uh, fault is essentially due to the sorts of people who have been working at the ICC. There's no doubt that in 2002, when the ICC itself actually launched, launched as an organization, it attracted, in line with the concept of the Rolls-Royce of courts, some of the best legal minds internationally. The actual reality is that they left very shortly afterwards. They left almost immediately after their particular contracts were, were actually ended. Uh, because the, the reality of the ICC was, I think, very apparent right from the start. And one of the big difficulties you have with the ICC is that uh, it's, it's actually appointed as full judges at the ICC, people who are meant to judge some of the most complex legal issues imaginable. Genocide, what exactly constitutes genocide? War crimes, crimes against humanity, what exactly constitutes these, these crimes? I mean, very complex legal issues. They appointed as full judges at the ICC people who had not only never been judges before, but had never been lawyers. So you could have actually picked anyone off the street here and made them a judge of the ICC, and they would probably have had more experience of day-to-day -day law than some of the people that were actually appointed as, as full-time judges at the ICC. In one instance, the only qualification that was met was that the judge spoke English. These are the people who have actually been involved in some of the travesties of justice, or in fact, actually because they've been involved, that you've seen the travesties of justice uh, um, within uh, the issues that the ICC has become involved on and, and in. So in many ways, um, you know, right from the start, uh, the ICC contained the seeds of its own destruction. And there's a, a very senior um, law professor in London who's a friend of the ICC, who actually in some exchanges on, on Twitter admitted that this, this, uh, this non-lawyer judge was actually appointed for budgetary considerations. That's to say, the government that actually wanted this uh, lawyer, this uh, a person appointed, paid the ICC $20 million that year to actually help to get the appointment of that judge. This is the level of corruption, unfortunately, within the ICC itself. And it hasn't been uh, just one example. There are many examples. Apparently running a children's NGO is a good qualification to become an ICC judge. So the ICC, unfortunately, has, um, has become the FIFA of the international uh, justice system because all this is actually predicated on the concept of vote trading. So the, the ICC itself is accountable, in, in theory, to the assembly of state parties. So if you are a member state, you can then actually meet once or twice a year, um, and one of your jobs is to actually help appoint the best legal qualified minds in the world, which is, of course, not happening. The, these countries will actually uh, uh, vote trade. So if you vote for my candidate for ICC judge, I'll vote for your candidate for the law of the sea convention or for this your treaty commission or whatever it is. Now, one thing that vote trading does not do is secure excellence. Vote trading means mediocrity. And this is exactly what you have now, unfortunately, at the ICC itself. Uh, in terms of its claims, the ICC itself also, of course, claimed it will be economical. 
It would be the most economical court in international justice. The fact is it's actually spent about 2 billion euros at this moment in time and has only um, seen maybe half a dozen convictions, some of which have been you know, very, very questionable. And one or two, they've actually had to overturn themselves because they were actually so, so questionable.